All right. What is up, everyone? Welcome. It is Saturday, July 22nd of 2023. So, yes, this is currently live. And if you're watching this live with us, um, welcome. Welcome back if you've been here before. And if you're going to watch this later on on recording, um, I hope you're welcome. And feel free to be able to ask any questions you want during, before, after. Uh, I'll do my best to always accommodate. So um, while we wait for people to trickle in, I'll tell you a little bit about what this live stream is if it's your first time watching it. So my name is Parham. I'm the weekly host of this show. And um, we, we cover a lot here, to be honest with you. It's, uh, we cover anything and everything that addresses addictions, mental health, personal development, understanding uh, codependency, communication patterns, rebuilding trust learning about trauma, abuse, um, self-care, and a little bit of everything in between. So good morning, everyone. And as you can see, it's really interactive. So we have a nice little community here. For example, Jim, what's up? Uh, Kathleen, good to see you. Hossein from the Bay. CJ, what's up? So as you leave your comments uh, or questions, I'm able to bring them on and kind of utilize them. We have people from all over the country, sometimes a few different countries that pop up on this thing. So it's a nice opportunity for this recovery community to connect. And um, so a few things about myself. I do have a master's degree in marriage and family therapy uh, with an emphasis in child development. Um, I am a licensed advanced alcohol and drug counselor. Uh, I am in recovery myself. So June 13th, 2008 is the day that I kind of just went on a different path and and started to uh, evolve, we'll call it, and stopped using uh, illicit substances and drugs and alcohol and all that kind of stuff and certain behaviors and lifestyles. Um, I am a high school basketball coach. So next week I won't be here, by the way, but outside of that, I'm good until about November where basketball season gets a little wild on the weekends. But um, I'm here pretty much every week and I'm very committed to this cause. And, I, and, I, and every time I do this talk, just so you know, it's dedicated to one thing. And that's the possibility of human transformation. So if that's something that piques your interest or if that's something that you might be looking for, I want you to know that this is going to be um, it's going to be it. So let's go with Jess. It's OK. I did email you back. So for all the people that watched last week, me struggle with the fact that I didn't email you. I did email you back. Just email me back and we'll figure it out. Um, and then when you're good morning. Mehnaz, what's up? What up, Mina over there? Mom and dad. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about a topic that sounds very cliche and is oftentimes overused and rarely ever applied. Isn't that funny? Something that's always talked about, but rarely do people actually apply it to their lives. And hopefully by the end of today's talk, I can increase your understanding and awareness of what this is. We're talking about self-care, why it's important, what are the checkpoints that you need to have and just kind of like address in your life? Because this journey of life is turbulent. This journey of life has a lot of blind twists and turns. And knowing that, which all you have to do is look back in your life and you can know exactly what I'm talking about, knowing that. It's safe to say that you can predict that the future will have very similar obstacles and challenges. Now, if you're coming from uh, a place that you're dealing with of yourself or someone else, addictions, mental illness, uh, traumas, you know, past traumas, current traumas, or any type of grief and loss, not only is self-care something that is needed, but I would go so far to say that it is required for your survival. And I'm not just saying like life and death stuff. Sometimes it is life and death. But I'm talking about survival and like sanity. The ability to navigate through those tough times. And the more you've experienced, the more self-care is needed. And so today what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and talk about 12 different uh, little thoughts, nuggets about self-care. And I want you to do an honest assessment of yourself. You know, I'm not, no one's watching. You're not taking a test, but just kind of look and see where you fall in all this stuff. And we'll go from there. Okay. So um, let's start off the very first thing. And I haven't done this talk before, by the way. So I have another talk called self-care is not 
a luxury. It's a necessity. It's a, a completely different talk. So this is new. I created it and hopefully it's going to be good for you guys. So number one, when dealing with self-care, you have to identify what your needs are. And the best way I can explain something like this is you want to look at your total well-being. What is our total well-being? It's our body. It's our emotions. It's our mind. It's our thoughts. And you want to do, you want to look inward and do some type of an assessment, some type of a diagnosis. For example, if you take your car to a garage, a mechanics store, shop, um, right before they take all our money, they do like a diagnostic check. And in that diagnostic check, they're going to find out what's right, what's wrong, lights, blah, 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 that kind of stuff. And then they can tell you what the plan of action is. See, without the diagnostic test, you don't know what you got to work on. So this evaluation to identify your needs is kind of like a self-imposed diagnostic check. So you want to look at your physical body. You know, you want to look at what hurts, what doesn't hurt. You want to look at, you know, the inside of your body, like your blood work. You want to look at your physical, the appearance of your body. You want to take a look at all this stuff and just see what's right, what's wrong, what needs a little bit more attention, what type of, what type of uh, engine lights are on just for identification purposes. Then you wanna do the same for your emotions. You wanna see how you're processing emotions. What kind of emotions do you have? Are they, are they primarily depressed? Are they primarily anxious? Are they primarily sad? Are they primarily full of fear? You wanna identify those emotions. Then you wanna look at your thought processes. Do you ruminate on thoughts? Are you obsessed about a certain thing? Are you having just negative pessimistic thoughts? You know, are you just having surface level thoughts? And the whole point of identification of all that, the whole point of assessing all that is to see what needs to be addressed in your, in your, when you're doing self-care. Because without it, where do you start? And some of you might say, Psh, it's all of it, man. I need all of that. Well, that just shows you got a lot of self-care to do. You know, it just shows that that's where you are and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with saying I, I checked 37 boxes. Oh, you got 37 boxes to work on. And the beauty of it is we don't have to work on all of them at the same time. Okay. So isn't basically uh, not just how you are right now, with St. John. I think sometimes we have patterns in the past. Sometimes we tend to repeat certain patterns over and over again. So even if you're not experiencing something right now, you might want to look in the past, you know, past five years, 10 years, 15 years ago and see where you had some deficiencies because the odds of those things popping up back again without addressing them or having some type of a proactive plan is very, very high. Dorothy, what's up from the Jersey Shore? Good to, good to see you here. Always a pleasure. Um, so the next one that I have is make time for yourself. Make time for yourself. And the first thing that I tell people, well, people tell me, when talking about self-care and going through all the different things I'm going to talk about, psh, I don't have time for that. I got to wake up. I got, I got kids to deal with. I got work to deal with. I have errands to run. I have family members to go visit. I don't have time for self-care. I don't buy that. I don't believe that. And I can't co-sign that. Are there some days that we objectively have a hard time finding time because it's just a one-off day or a two-off day that just everything slammed? Yes, that can happen. If that's happening all the time, you are just not prioritizing yourself. You are saying yes to way too many things. You are agreeing to do way too many things at, the, at your own cost. See, all human beings, the homeless gentleman or woman that's walking in the street right now, and the billionaire on top of some billion, billion dollar mountain, uh, they both got 24 hours in a day. And if you think that billionaire on a, on a billion dollar mountain uh, has a lot of free time, you're out of your mind. Those people are the busiest people on this planet. And I'm telling you this, that time is not this thing that some people have more of or you have less of. Time is a straight prioritization thing. It's a straight prioritization thing. You create, you carve, you develop pockets of time to make for yourself, to implement self-care. And the more I talk about this, the more you're going to realize that I'm not asking for hours a day. 
I might be asking for 30 minutes in the daytime, 30 minutes at nighttime. If you can't carve that for yourself, you're not trying because I promise you, if you sat down and really hour by hour, wrote down your day, hour by hour, not in just one of your days, an entire week, including the weekends, you will be very, very shocked and surprised of how much time is actually available for self-care. Now, what happens is people say, oh, but I did so much. I'm so tired. I just need to, I just need to unwind now. You know, so many people spend so much of their time just unwinding, you know, when, when we really got to recharge and don't get me wrong, we'll talk about unwinding. There's a time and place for it, but it's not the primary uh, self-care tactic. It's one of the self-care tactics. So the next one that I have here, feel free to interrupt anytime you want, ask questions like Hussein did right there. I'm gladly able to, to answer. Um, the next one that I have here is to prioritize your sleep. And yes, this includes adults too. You know, it's so funny, like uh, adults are so obsessed with the sleeping patterns of their children. I mean, infants just run your world. I mean, they, they do whatever the hell they want to do, right? So like, we're not talking about infants, but like when kids get a little bit older, parents are so obsessed with bedtime they're just like, if they don't sleep, they're going to be little monsters. If they don't sleep, they're going to be tired in the morning. They have to sleep at this time. They have to sleep at this time. Adults are obsessed about the sleeping times of children until they become adults themselves. Then they're just like, nah, it's okay. I could just watch that next show. I could just go to sleep a couple hours later. I could just make up for it in the morning with an extra few shots of espresso in my coffee. You know? We are no different than children. And I used to struggle with this years ago uh, because of workaholism. I would go to sleep routinely around 12, one o'clock in the morning and wake up around five, six o'clock every single day. And it was just because I couldn't stop working and couldn't stop learning and going to school and doing all that kind of stuff. Uh, I grew out of that in the past couple of years. And sleep is so important. I mean, I got like a tracker that makes sure that I'm sleeping optimized. And I look at my sleep scores and I look at all that kind of stuff because the sharper I am in the daytime is a direct result of the type of rest I got the night before. And it's not just one, one for one every night. It's the same way. Sometimes you can sleep well and still be tired the next day because of life. But over the course of a 365, you'll have way more productive days if you actually, actually sleep. And why is this even more important for people like you that are going through firsthand or secondhand the addiction or the mental illness or the grief and loss and all that kind of stuff because your sleep is seriously disrupted. The quality of sleep you have is disrupted. The type of sleep you have is disrupted. I mean, how many parents sleep with a phone on their chest because they're waiting for the ambulance to call and say they got their kid overdosed? A lot of people. And it's kind of like if your sleep has been disrupted for so many years because of addiction, listen to this. It's the equivalent of someone going into a ER room with just shattered legs and femurs and all that kind of stuff from like a motorcycle accident. And the doctor says, your recovery is going to take six months, eight months, a year. You can't walk for this amount of time. Like it's so severe because the fractures are so much. The rest deficiency in a lot of family members is so severe because the poor quality of sleep that you've gotten for so many years that you have to sleep. And you're like, well, what if I sleep and something happens? I don't know. I can't promise that for you. And if it does, I'm sorry. But if it doesn't, at least you start to get some rest back. And it's your responsibility to do so. I know a lot of people have hard time sleeping and they're like, I've always had a hard time sleeping. And the reason is they go back to their childhood and they come from dysfunctional homes and chaotic homes and people yelling and screaming and all that kind of stuff like that. And they couldn't sleep and they never addressed it all. And now they just think they're a person that can't sleep. You know, all these things have root causes. Sometimes people stress so much. They're warriors. They think about the future, the future, the future, the future. They lay in bed and they can't sleep. You know, and there's, there's ways to combat all that stuff, by the way. Let's see what CJ said. Five to nine is my time. One thing for my body, spirit, my body and spirit. This is action, a program, structure, routine brings freedom. That's a hard lesson to learn, but it's important. 
Atomic Habits is a is good. Yeah, that's a great book, by the way. Um, and but and when she says five to nine is my time, man, this is like someone that's so committed to self care that's waking up with the intention to invest in self. Not many people. Congratulations, by the way, that you're up that early doing that stuff. Not that many people commit to themselves the first thing in the morning. They get up and they say, oh, I got to do this, this, and this for everybody else. That takes prioritization. Um, so Jim is talking about the older I get. Well, you're still a young man, Jim, so you got a long way to go. I get the more, I, the more important my sleep cycle gets. Absolutely, man. It's a, it's, it's a life hack. It's one of the most important things. You know, we, we, I think we adjust and adapt so much to functioning off little sleep that we think it's like normal or it's possible. It is, but we're just not where we need to be. You know, we're just not where we need to be. So the next one that I have here is eat nutritious food. Oh, here he goes. Here goes the man on the rant. Um, I'm not going to talk about a specific diet. I'm not going to talk about my specific diets or beliefs because when I do so, it's polarizing. And you guys know I'm not one of those people that tries to divide. I try to join. So I'm going to do my best to talk this in a way that encompasses all people. Um, nutrition is one of the most important factors of mental health. How are they, how are they connected? They are absolutely connected. When your body has the minerals, the vitamins, the nutrients it needs to be able to thrive, the mind will operate more efficiently. When you're putting in real food, void of ingredient labels, real food, void of packaging and processed stuff and chemicals, your body is going to operate better and your mind will be more clear. I'm not saying that all food replaces all medicine or anything like that. Please don't go that far. But I'm saying there is a significant connection and correlation between food and our body. When you're talking about self-care, body is one component of it. You know, I, I just put a post uh, a few days ago and it was the results of my blood work. I'm doing like a whole screening because of everything that happened to my brother. I just want to make sure that um, I'm healthy, you know, and, and I'm going to be doing some work to check out my heart and all that kind of stuff in a few weeks, some stress tests and EKGs and echoes and all that kind of stuff. Um, but my levels of cholesterol were way, way, way lower than just the middle of the range. I mean, it was just barely almost up, up, uh, obsolete. It almost didn't even exist. And I've been battling this dialogue, this conversation for so many years with my own family, not, not just strictly my, my poor mom and dad that are watching, it's just all my family, you know, and a lot of people. And just they're, they're like, yeah, man, but just cholesterol, the genetic thing, and it's just in our family and it's in this and that. And, and I have some really strong genetic ties to my family members that say these kind of things. And despite of genetic predisposition. Despite of cardiovascular disease and strokes and heart attacks in my own family, like serious people, like paternal, maternal, like family members, I have little to no signs of cardiovascular disease, cholesterol. And trust me, it's not my age. 40 years old, I know it's young, but it's not my age. It has to do specifically and exclusively with the fact that I do not put cholesterol in my body. <laughs> at all and dietary cholesterol and it's just so powerful to see that in despite of that you know there's still resistance of that theory and it's uh i don't know numbers don't lie so if you want to see my blood work i will gladly show it to you as well um but yeah and so when you go to the grocery store when i say eat nutritious foods if you don't know what i'm talking about just go and scoop the outside of the store so inside every grocery store small or big the outside is where all of the real food is, the fresh food, the produce. If you eat the, the, the dairy stuff and the, the meat stuff and all that kind of stuff, it's all on the outside. There are no ingredient labels on the outside. It is mono ingredient. So whatever the, whatever the food is, is the food. And that's called whole food. So if you eat whole foods, 
the odds of your body optimizing and being more um, healthy are greater. But a lot of times people just go down the, down the, um, down the little alleys, I guess, if you will, the grocery store. And, you know, I have a little bit of compassion when it comes to certain, you know, fam- people's have like, you know, families, big families, and this and that. And it, it gets a little bit more difficult, but check this out. So I have a few employees, right, that you have big families and maybe one of them is watching right now. But um, and he's like, dude, it's impossible with all the kids I got and all this and that. It's, it's just impossible. And he is true on uh, many different levels that it's very freaking difficult. I'll never say impossible. Very difficult. But when the kids aren't around, right, like when the kids ain't around and it's just him or her eating their food, they still make the choices they would as if the kids were around. So I just, I don't understand these whole ways that people look at this when they, uh, when society as a whole is really struggling with this uh, epidemic. It really is struggling with this epidemic. Um, You guys know one third of the country is obese and two thirds are overweight. One third is obese and two thirds are overweight out of 350 million people. Um, by the year 2025, our healthcare system is not going to be able to sustain the amount of children that are going to need services for type two diabetes. And you know what? I've, I've been saying that line since 2017 on video. And here I am saying it again. And guess what? It's only getting worse. Um, yeah, CJ, that is a good book. Yeah, I think Serapis recommended it to me a while ago. Um, your brain on food. So it, it really starts talking about the drug-like components of, of food. Um, this is good too. I like this. Eating a quality food is a sign of respect for my body and state. Yeah, and you know what? That's, that's true. So when we are more stressed, we tend to stress eat. So what happens is when you're feeling anxious or depressed, we go for the high caloric, high fat foods. And you want to know why? Because when we eat them, we don't have to feel. We don't have to think. It just numbs us. And there's the choice again. Ain't no different than that. The many things that a lot of people in society do, but have a bad rap to them. Uh, The next one that I have here is... This one just goes with that. I'll be quick on it, but it just say hydrated uh, and hydrated means with fluids because society, including myself, for example, uh, caffeine is widely used and I love caffeine and I use caffeine. Um, as you can tell by the way I talk, I'm probably caffeinated, but caffeine's a diuretic and caffeine dehydrates the, the body really bad and it's a diuretic. So it flushes you out and dehydrates you. So the drinking water, and you can also get water from like, you know, from fruit, like it's, it's, it's melon season, watermelon, stuff like that. You can get water. But I will tell you this. Many people who suffer from headaches, chronic fatigue and all that kind of stuff. And I'm not a medical doctor, so I'm not diagnosing it. But one of the reasons and causes is oftentimes dehydration. We think that we are hydrated because we had that one glass of water, but we don't know how much hydration we actually need to feel optimized for our brain to work. These are all like tissues, man. It's like, they all flow together. 70% of our body is liquid. It's, it's important. It's very important, but people neglect it. And you know, it's like, I've said this every week, I think maybe for three years, things that are easy to do in life are also easy not to do. I understand that it's easy to drink a glass of water, but it's also easy not to drink a glass of water. And it just comes down to deliberation, consciousness, choice, action, and wanting to do something. Let's see what Jim says. Yeah, man, ca- coffee only in the mornings. That's pretty much mine too. You know, it's uh, once in a while on the weekend or something, if I wanted to stay up a little bit longer, I'll have a little co- coffee in the afternoon, like mid- mid-afternoon. But outside of that, yeah, I, I, I prioritize my sleep. And that's something I learned. You know, I, I was getting caffeinated all day long. And at nighttime, I'm just staring at the ceiling. You know, and then you got to look into getting like, oh, now I need something to help me sleep. And that's just not a healthy, sustainable pattern. So, um, yeah, juices are wonderful, you know. And and it's always funny, you know, whenever I recommend people to like have juices and like have fruit and all that kind of stuff, 
they <laughs> people always talk about like oh there's so much calories and juice and it's, it's uh, so much sugar in it and all, all that kind of stuff man nobody's ever gained significant amount of weight from eating apples or having apple juice you know what i mean it's like there's so many misconceptions and so many beliefs that people have um that are just so categorically false and and it's okay and it's okay so the next one that I have here is to make sure you engage in physical activity. Now, as soon as I say this to clients, for example, they say, well, I don't have time to go to the gym. It's like, whoa, 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 who said go to the gym? Just do something for your body. Just put on your favorite music and go walk for 15 minutes. Just go do something every day. That's not just getting in and out of your car or running an errand. It's with the intention that I'm gonna go move my body. Now, 15 minutes is like the straight minimum daily. 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour. Just do something every day for your body. When you move your body, the mind will follow. So sometimes people wanna think themselves into like working out. Like, okay, I just gotta work out. I know I have to work out. I know I have to go on a walk. Don't do that. You're never going to win. Go on a walk despite of not wanting to go on a walk. And somewhere during the walk, your body, your mind's going to be like, oh, it's kind of nice that I'm walking right now. Move your body and the mind will follow. That's enough about that one. I'm very obsessed with that one, by the way. It's the it's what's helped me stay sane in the past few months of my life. Um, the next one that I have is. This is another one of those interesting ones. So practice mindfulness and meditation. A little bit goes a long way. As soon as I tell somebody to practice mindfulness and meditation, they tell me reasons why they can't meditate. Oh, I just can't sit still. I just can't quiet my mind. My thoughts are always going. It doesn't work for me. Don't go there. Just listen to what this actually means. Mindfulness and meditation can be a very small part of your day. Like for those of you who don't practice any type of breathing exercises and techniques, when is the last time you stopped and took three, four, five, six conscious, deep breaths while holding the breath in your lung, feeling your lung expand, exhaling all of that air and all the stress and all the toxins and all of whatever's inside your body leaving your stomach empty for a few seconds and repeating that process. It's, it's a cleansing breath. When's the last time you stop to do that? That has nothing to do with, I can't slow down my mind. I can't sit there and do nothing. I can't just be quiet. It has nothing to do with it. Mindful breathing is the easiest way to tap into what I'm talking about right here. It's super simple, but it's also easy not to do. You know, I was telling our program participants this morning, for the ones who have a hard time with closing their eyes and, you know, all that kind of traditional meditation stuff, the way that for me, and I'm an overthinker, I think a lot. I have a hard time sitting still, very hard time sitting still. For me, when I wanted to get, you know, get going with this, and I've done this a bunch of times in the past few months because it's like, uh, sometimes it's overwhelming. I go and I stare at the ocean. I sit down at the beach. I stare at the ocean. And all I do is watch the repetitive waves crash on the shore. And all I do is watch the wave go up, crash on the shore. And I try to listen to the sound of the water crashing. And I do this. And thankfully for me, the waves usually don't stop or they're very frequent. So I just get in this flow of watching it crash, hearing it crash, smelling the salt water, and it repeats. And it repeats and it repeats and it repeats. And before you know it, I don't notice anything around me. And before you know it, my thoughts get quiet. And that's a meditative state. Didn't even have to even think about my thoughts. The, the presence in that experience did it for me. So I don't know what it is for you that you need to implement in your life that helps you practice mindfulness and meditation. Sometimes going on a walk and just observing everything you see that might be the color yellow or the color red. And just being and just noticing it or walking and just being mindful of every step you take left, right, left, 
right? Something as simple as that. These are all meditative practices. Most people can't sit down and close their eyes and meditate for a long time. The ones that do have practiced that to get to that point. They train at it daily to get to that point. A lot of people compare their first day of meditation to the homie over there that's been doing it for 27 years. Like, come on. It's like the first time you hit a piano key, you don't expect to play like Mozart. If you want to be like that person, meditate every day. I don't. Most people don't want to be that excessive meditator, right? We got stuff to do. But self-care routine, it's a part of it. And some days you're going to need a little bit more of it. You know, so find times to uh, unwind. And yeah, and this is a good one too, out with the old and in with the new. You know, it's like a mantra you could say, you know, it's just kind of a, it's a cleansing thought, actually. I like that, Jim. Um, the next one that I have here is to set boundaries. Learn what your limits are and when and how to say no. So I have a whole talk on boundaries. I'm not going to get into the actual boundaries talk when it comes to addiction and recovery. Um, there's certain things that are very important. For example, the one that I'll just reiterate, if you set a boundary with somebody, make sure that you honor it and hold it. Because if you don't, they're just going to push that limit over and over and over again. And then, so if you're not going to enforce a boundary, don't set it. Just don't waste your time. But when it comes to self-care, you have to learn how to say no. Again, go back to the one about time. People say they don't have enough time. I think that's more of a boundary issue. I think it's way more of a boundary issue that they just overexhausted themselves and and just overstretched themselves to the illusion that I have no time. But if they would have said no to a bunch of stuff, the time would have been there. So a lot of people have a hard time saying no. And that usually comes from childhood dysfunction. It usually comes from some type of a emotional disruption and they just want to say yes and they want to be approved and they want to people please and they want to be the nice guy or the nice girl and all that kind of stuff. And that's okay if you want to do that. It's none of my business. Just know that it's going to have a cost on your mental health. And when you set boundaries for yourself, it's all on you to identify what those are. And then you got to uphold them. And you got to learn how to say, you know, the homework assignment that I always give on this one is a uh, Learn to say no. So when someone asks you to do something, say no to them. Especially if you're the one that always says yes. And do that to like three different people. And when you say no to their request, don't explain to them. Don't give them your reasoning why. Don't qualify it. Don't make sure they're okay and not upset. Just say no. It's just an exercise. You know, later on, you can go tell them what you were doing, you know, afterwards. Maybe like a week, two weeks after it. So you can actually sit with the feelings. But most people, when they say no, they feel guilty and ashamed and embarrassed. And they're like, oh, they're going to think I'm such a bad friend. Like if a one time rejection of someone's request makes someone else think you were a bad friend, your friendship probably wasn't anything in the first place. Just so you know that. Um, yeah, that's a good, that's a congratulations. So saying that's a, that's a accomplishment. Um, and it's, he said, I used to never say no, but today I can and have been able to clearly say no. Um, And it's really important because you finally chose yourself and it doesn't mean you love somebody less or, you know, by, by not doing something over and over again, it's like, Oh, you're a bad person. Now at some point it's like, we have to honor ourselves and we can't just do everything at our own cost of our own mental well being. because a lot of this stuff, by the way, turns into sickness in the body, my friends. Uh, Jim said, I had to change my diet almost two years ago, set boundaries on self and so far so good. Yeah. And it's, you know, and this is a good example that I wrote, uh, eat nutritious food. If not now, when, um, it's never too late to do this stuff. It really isn't, you know, a couple years ago for Jim, he could have just been like, you know what, never mind, I don't want to do it, but you know, he, he still wants a quality of life and he, and he chose that quality of life and, and he didn't have to, he could have just been that everything exactly as, as, as it was. You know, and, and the cards fall however they fall, but he took some action in his life. And, uh, you know, the results is in the blood work, right? The results is in the data. It's not that just like you just think that you're getting better. You look at your blood work two years ago. You look at your blood work now. You see significant declines in all of those dangerous markers. And it's correlated directly to that one decision. You know, Um The next one that we have here, there's 12 of them. So the next one says engage in hobbies. 
Now, do things that make you lose track of time. For a lot of uh, people experiencing addictions, mental illness, uh, trauma, grief and loss, there's something that happens and that thing is called anhedonia. What anhedonia is, is the loss of pleasure in things and activities that at one point would give us pleasure. So for example, if you were a kid and riding a bike was just the most amazing, epic experience of your life, and now you've gone through this whole process of addictions, mental illness, trauma, grief and loss, and just the thought of getting on a bike is like, what's the point? Where are we gonna go? It's gonna be so crowded over there. Oh, what's, I, just, I just don't wanna do it. See, that's this thing called anhedonia. You know that riding a bike gave you pleasure at one point, but right now you can't find it. So what we do is we do it anyways. Because as a kid, it was never about where we were going or what we were doing. It was about getting on the bike and just going. It's the journey, not the freaking destination. And as adults, we forget that. We forget the joy that exists in the journey. So if you want to break through anhedonia, you have to do things that at one point gave you pleasure in your life. And you'll find them. And when you do, you lose track of time. And that's the magic. How did it get this hour of the day? I, it flew by. That's the healing stuff. And when's the last time you did something that made you lose track of time? Man. When's the last time you did something for the first time? How about that question? Oof. The last time you did something for the first time. You know, at some point in our life, everything we did was the first time. At some point in your life, everything you ever did in your life was the first time you were doing it. But now, when I ask you, when's the last time you did something for the first time? Some of you might say years ago. Oh, that's so sad. When did we stop living? And we just started existing. Conscious choice again. The next one that we have is connect with others. The opposite of addiction is connection. Um, it doesn't have to be a lot of people. It could be a small little community like this that we have. It could be a couple of your close friends, family members. It could be a sponsor. It could be a therapist. Whatever it is, you just got to make sure that you connect. And the more we experience pain as a result of addiction, mental illness, trauma, grief, and loss, the more we tend to disconnect right? And that's our natural response. For many of you that are in the recovery process, you know that, uh-uh, that's dangerous. I don't want to isolate. I'm going to go connect. But there's a lot of people who don't know that. And they go into isolation. And what happens in isolation? Nothing good grows in the dark, right? It just tends to manifest in different ways, doubling down on potentially the addiction, doubling down on the mental illness, doubling down on the pain from resulting from the trauma, you know, making the grief and loss last forever. I've, I've uh, worked with people that someone in their life passed away like seven or eight or 10 years ago. And it never goes away. So this is something I'm learning. You know, the pain's going to always be there. But they are so, they, they've isolated and stopped talking about it for so long that they feel the intensity of it as if it just happened. And that just tells me that they didn't do the healing process. Now, can someone be super emotional about something that happened years ago and just like feel the sadness? Absolutely. But I'm talking about to the point that they can't function. They can't function in their life, impaired in every level at work, relationships, health, all that kind of stuff because of something that happened there. And when you go back and find out what happened, they say they stopped talking about it. They fully isolated. They just kind of gave up. They died when they died. You know, so make sure that we connect. And let's see what we got here. Comment. What should be the quality of those who we connect to? Um, I think that's a, it's a good question, but I think it's very um, specific for the individual. So for example, what you think is quality in somebody might not be someone that I think is quality in them. You know, like it's like, I might not look to them for advice or look up to them, but you might. And vice versa, what I might look into and up to, it might not be someone that you find the quality. So it comes down to your personal values. That's a good answer. And what you think is important. And is that person aligned with those values? Usually when our values align with somebody, we tend to get the best outcome. You know, usually that's the case. Yeah, pain is inevitable. Suffering, however, an option. I choose not to live by. Yeah. I, you know, I'll, I'll uh, 
I'll dabble my toe in suffering gym for like maybe a couple hours, maybe a day or two, but then I just snap out of it, you know, and uh, I'll take the pain any day, you know, I'll take the pain any day, but the suffering, it's not for me, not for people like us. How about that? Uh, The next one that I have here is limit your screen time, unplug to relax. Digital fatigue is a thing. I know you're watching me on a digital screen right now. And I know that we all use these things called cell phones and laptops and we watch these things called televisions and, you know, uh, we go to movie theaters and all that kind of stuff like that. I'm not saying that all of that is bad. Okay, so please hear me out. The same way that food isn't bad. All this stuff isn't bad. There is a beautiful time, a place, a purpose, a value from it. But you got to limit the screen time you have. You know, I did this talk with our program participants earlier, and I think this is pretty important. Look at it this way. In big business, right, like capitalist big business, rarely do they ever offer any of their products for free. It's just the way it is. It's the way the markets are, and we're all cool with that. Supply, demand, there's a cost for services. If you agree, you pay for it, they give you the service, and it's a handshake, it's all good, okay? So in big business, there's usually a cost associated with But where a lot of people are struggling right now is on social media apps, for example. Let's just go with TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, right? When is the last time that you paid a monthly subscription for your TikTok account? When is the last time that you paid a monthly subscription for your Facebook account? When is the last time that you paid a monthly subscription to your Instagram account? The answer is never, never, never. So big business is providing us with a service For free? Come on. That ain't happening. So what is the commodity being exchanged for that service? If it's not our money, it's our human attention. We are paying with us. We are paying with our attention. And they can get that algorithm so damn good, so good, that your wall and your feet could be so personalized that it can capture your attention for hours and hours and hours and hours. Go look at your screen time on your social media apps and see if you're using social media or is social media using you. Now, for some of you older generation that maybe have not grown up with a phone in your hand, you might actually be using social media. But for your sons, your daughters, your grandkids, your nieces, your nephews, your younger siblings, they think they're using social media. Oh, man. Oh, my. Are they the ones being played? You know, these some of these kids got screen times of like eight, 10 hours a day. Who's using who? So limit your screen time. Unplug. I love take. I love going places, leave my phone at home. People think I'm crazy. I don't care. I understand there could be an emergency and sometimes in life there is, but I've also realized that in my 40 years of life, there's only been a few emergencies ever. If you break down all those into days, you'll come up with a very, 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 very large number, very large number. And if you break that down to the two incidents of the emergencies and that large number and you get a percentage, it is so damn low that it's not even mathematically important. What's the point of being hyper-connected to something that's taking away our human attention to this thing called life? You know, people function fine, I guess, back in the day without cell phones, right? I was, I was okay. It was okay. Life was good. Um, so the next one that we have, well, there's a couple comments. Love, yeah, love my movies. Hey, you can, you can watch your movies, Jim. It's kind of like, that's like, uh, that's a, that's a totally healthy recreational and social few hours in a week to go spend somewhere. But there ain't nothing wrong with that. You know, which ones are bad, Jim? It's the, it's the person, I'm not even going to say young person. It's the person that goes to work all day, goes, sits on a couch after work, sits down on their couch, puts on Netflix and watches Show after show after show after show after show goes to sleep at two o'clock in the morning, 
barely is able to get up in the morning because of what they did the night before. And they're so distracted and unfocused at work. All they do is scroll on their phone and just counting down to get home again. They go to the fast food on the way home and they watch the next season of the same damn show that next night. There's a difference. There is a difference. Subliminal messaging. Everything's got a subliminal message. This probably has a subliminal message. And the last one of self-care is seek help when needed. Mental health matters. You know, each of you that have logged on to this and are watching this live or later on, you're doing something for your mental health. This is a professional. I am a professional. So you're seeking professional health help. The same way you break something, you go to a doctor. Same way you feel something in your arm, a tumor or something. You go to the doctor and say, doctor, help me. Mental health is the same way. You know, I understand that it's not until recent years, you know, in the past 20, 30, 40 years that people started to really look at the mind and our mental health just as important as physical health. But we're here now and it's important. And if you've already seeked out help for it, do it. If you're going through anything um, and you're struggling with your mental health, go get some professional help um, because it's vital and critical and crucial for your survival. You can't navigate this world without having your head on right, you know, and our mental health matters. So um, if you if you are someone, you know, living this journey called life, I hope this talk inspired you to be proactive and start to diagnose and assess what you actually need in life. Create a men create a self-care plan. Execute it. Execute it to the best of your ability. So when the time comes that life comes and punches you in the face, you know, you're not going to get so disoriented that you can't, you can't function. And that's sometimes the best we can do. And, you know, if nothing happens, then you're just going to feel better and better. And uh, my hope is that every human being has a self-care plan and takes this seriously. And the sad part about it, like I said earlier, it's probably the most talked about topic in mental health circles when people get asked for help. And it's probably the least executed because don't you know, my situation is different. Don't you know how busy I am? Don't you know how stressed out I am? Don't you know how much responsibilities I have? I don't have time for this stuff. I have to help this, this, and this person. Oh, I don't have the money to eat that kind of food. I have to eat this kind of food. Um, I don't have the time to do it. And as soon as you tell people to start investing in themselves, all they do is tell you reasons why they can't. And I don't know why that happens, but you don't have to be one of those people. Uh, live beyond your excuses live beyond your reasons of why you can't do something and find some reasons of why you not only can do something, but you need to do something. What's the point of living life if you're not living the best version of yourself? And the only person that can bring out that best version of yourself, go take a look in the mirror. It's that person looking right back at you. And I hope that person's smiling back at you today. Um, and if that's the case, then we're all good. All right, my friends. I won't be here for this group next week, but I will be here the following week. And again, if you're a local in Orange County, every Tuesday at 6.30 p.m., we have a, a family support education group facilitated by myself. It is free to attend. Anyone and everyone is welcomed as long as you've experienced some type of addiction, mental illness, trauma, or grief and loss, whether it's firsthand or secondhand. I don't even care. Just come on down and I'll gladly have you there. So have a wonderful weekend. Take care, everyone.